Hello, what's up? My name's Seb and welcome to the Jump Inside podcast. Before we get started, I'm just going to let you know what we're going to be talking about in today's podcast. And we're going to be talking about games that we were interested in playing in the past and present, as well as things that we're going to be looking forward to in the future, as well as the future of gaming. But first, a quick message from one of our members who wasn't able to attend in today's podcast. Take it away. Hi everybody, it's Jay from Armadeus. I just wanted to say thank you uh, for all of your time and listening to this podcast and supporting all of us here at Jump Inside. Um, I also wanted to say happy holidays to everybody and whatever holiday you celebrate. Have a fantastic time. Put your feet up or smash it, whatever you're doing, you know. And I want to say that everybody here at Armadeus who has been on, will be on, and, you know, is currently on, including Branigan, send all their love to you for this holiday season. So have a fantastic time. Look after yourself and we'll see you in the new year. Bye. Thank you. And let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Seb and welcome to the Jump Inside end of the month podcast. It is the end of December, we're just about to hit New Year, but before we do, we've got one final video to output. Welcome to the podcast everyone, and we are going to be talking, uh, we're going to do a theme this day because you know it's the end and i want to give it some kind of end of the year some festive kind of theme uh so yeah that's what we're gonna do um so i've got some people on the podcast that will join me so i'll introduce them before we get down to it so um uh, danny would you like to introduce the first one because you're also going to be helping me co-present this podcast i want to introduce blue fox uh, hello it's a pleasure to be here thank you thank you that's our live studio audience. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so, so tell us, uh, Blue, about your channel. Well, uh, I've already been here uh, countless times, so I'll make it quick. I'm Blue Fox 98 I do videos about video game discussion and analysis, especially talking about uh, open worlds, game mechanics, and whatnot. And uh, as I always say, it is a pleasure to be here. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, I'm going to shoot over to Camazoid. Camazoid, would you like to tell us about your channel really quickly? Oh, well, I guess uh, I've been here for a very long while, so probably people are very familiar with uh, my channel. I don't have lots to say since I'm known for being the Elden Boy or Elden Guy, whatever. So um, <laughs> the Elden Boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm I'm cringy. I know. Anyway, uh, I've been doing nothing but focusing on some Elden Ring content and basically taking some time off to try to rethink. What I'm gonna do next for my channel, but it's gonna remain some Elden Ring content. But I'm doing great. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, I do just want to add the fact that me, Blue Fox, and Camazord keep saying we've been here a while. It's, I feel like we're starting to get like a retirement home of podcasts here. Like we're just like yeah, I've seen you thousands of times. Um, but uh, we've got a new person onto the podcast. I'm gonna introduce. This is Jalex Fon, and he's come with all his sound effects this evening. In the world, there is one, <laughs> one to make the community happy. His name is Jalex Fawn. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. Hello, everyone. My name is Jalex Fawn. I believe I'm the only American on this podcast. Uh, my channel, um, it's about communi community, really. Um, I'm a variety channel, but primarily I do gaming. I try to stream once a week with my subs so they can join, so they feel like they have a friend and someone to go to when they're lonely. But thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Brilliant. I will make sure all of these podcast links, uh, th or their, all their channel links are down in the description if you do want to check any of their channels out. Um, and every single one of our podcast members does excellent videos. We do hunt for only the best. So uh, definitely check all their channels out. 
after you're done watching the podcast this evening. Anyway, let's get started. Um, I'm going to go over to Danny quickly. Danny, this podcast is very interesting because we've got some rules for this podcast. you want to go over the rules for me? So we, we have a twist of this podcast. The twist is it's going to be about a Christmas carol. So basically, we'll be focusing on games of the past and present and future. The way the rules work is for a past game, you have to talk about a game that came out more than three years ago. For a present game, you will say a game that came out this year and you've played this year. For a future game, you'll talk about a game that you're excited to play in the future, like next year or the next 10 years that was absolutely perfect well done oh that, that was perfect timing as well that was good <laughs> yeah the music cut out right at the end there <laughs> all right okay so let's get kick, kick started with the first question danny it's on you okay first question i might ask this to blue fox blue fox what games have you been interested in playing in the past before 2022 what games i was interested in, playing in the past Yes. Oh, but the games that I've played or games that I would like to play that I did not have the chance to play yet? Yeah. Yes to which one? The second one. <laughs> the second one. <laughs> <laughs> the second one. Option B. Option B. Uh, can we turn it on? Okay, uh, chokes aside. Uh, games that I have not played but have been already released uh, are, of course, countless. Uh, the first one that comes to mind uh, is uh, Assassin's Creed uh, uh, Odyssey, which uh, is uh, one of the Assassin's Creed I've not the chance to play. I know that it's very different from uh, you know the mainline titles of Assassin's Creed, and people have predicted both uh, uh, Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla to have kind of a more RPG side to it, rather than action adventure like the original Assassin's Creed. However, I do want to play it in a more you know open-minded setting, where I say, okay, I play it as an RPG type of game set in ancient Greece and uh, perhaps have fun with it. So yeah, that's one game I would like to play that was released, uh, I believe, uh, uh, in 2018, something like that. So about three years ago. Awesome. Um, I'm going to say the same actual question there and I'm going to pass it over to um, Jalex. Jalex, what games have you been interested in playing before the year of 2022? Well, thanks for asking. Um... To be honest with you, uh, there was a lot of games in the past because I didn't really get my setup and like get really into console gaming and have good uh, PC until like really recently. So one game that comes to mind uh, from 2005 actually uh, was Shadow of the Colossus. Ah yes, if you guys know that game. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it was no just idea. a very, very. Oh, so if you don't know, Shadow of the Colossus is a uh, third person. Kind of based on like medieval times where these giant beasts were roaming around and you have to go around and try and smite them it's just a lot of open world and it's just really nicely done and just the sheer sheer scale of it was very interesting to me but i never got to play because i never had a console that could play it or a pc that could play it also they're the same people that made uh the last guardian if you know that game that came out a couple years back i do i must say it does look like it's a bit of ahead of its time has it had a remake yeah, well, yeah, it's kind of like a remake remastered because it's not exactly a remake, but the graphics and how the game looks and feels have they did change a lot. It's been like let's say remastered by Bluepoint Games, and they get and it looks really fantastic. Okay, very interesting. I I like that. Yeah. All right, then I'm also gonna ask this question to Camazoid. Camazoid, what games have you been interested in playing? in the past before 2022 okay the list is kind of long i do have like a lot of games that i really wanted to uh, play but couldn't have the ch chance because i i don't have a ps5 still trying to get one but uh, we all know how that is but anyway uh the game that i really want to play i guess it is an obvious choice to some of you i would say is Demon Souls, specifically Demon Souls Remake. It came out on PS5. I'm a huge fan of the From Software games, and as you guys know, I'm a huge lunatic to Elden Ring. And Demon Souls is the only game from them that I didn't play, so that's one that I really want to try out. And the only one, one of their games left that I didn't finish. Other than that, there are other games that I really want to try out. We got uh, like Cyberpunk 2077. It's currently is being fixed and it's looking very well and I do plan on trying that one out 
and uh, Returnal. I heard a lot of good news about Returnal, and I, I heard that it's very hard and difficult, and that's a game that I really want to try out because sometimes I really want a game that can kick my ass, and we all know how that is. And yeah, those are all the games that I've missed out. There are a lot, the, but so far these are the few games that I really want to play, but I couldn't have the chance to. Okay, so before we move on to the next question, I just want to ask, like, um, and and this just goes out to anyone, what 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 really like, um, what makes you um, actually no, I'm gonna ask Jalex personally, um, oh, thank you. before we move on, um, what make on Shadow of the Colossus, what makes you like, what made you go like, that's the particular game, I wanted to, what what's what's unique about that particular game that you wanted to like say that particular game for? I mean, for me, I really like fantasy games and i like adventure games the exploration is big and just the sheer scale like i was saying there was for its time i feel like it was ahead of its time because there was these giant monsters and it was like free roaming for the most part but it kind of reminds me of like an upscale legend of zelda okay and i i loved legend of zelda growing up i played ocarina of time on the old nintendo 64 and it, it reminded me a lot of that. And then Breath of the Wild going forward basically was a lot like Shadow of the Colossus from what I could see. And that I really enjoyed. So I probably would really enjoy being able to go back and play uh, Shadow of the Colossus. I also wanted to play their newer game, The Last Guardian, but I didn't get to play that either. Okay. Uh, I, I remember that time because that's the time for me when I was like, I wanted to really get into... Um games like halo and adventurous and i completely missed out of the playstation era so that that was kind of a miss for me so i didn't really get to get in that era so i was i was like always an xbox fanboy i was like ah i want to play the next thing you know we got to play the arbiter and all that kind of stuff so uh, mm -hmm. um we, yeah we, i must we didn't, say we didn't PlayStation get that adventure. exclusives are pretty dope yeah i think um i think personally between all those games I definitely think that PlayStation definitely had a bit of creativity around the time of those past 2005, and that's what PlayStation really built on. It built on story games. Um, uh, and I, I know games like Ubisoft also did some of that stuff as well. So like um, things like uh, Assassin's Creed have always been a massive pass hitter combat situation. As uh, as uh, I, I, B Fox, you mentioned. You mentioned um, Assassin's Creed, didn't you, did, just yes. a second ago? Uh, but I would say that Shadow of the Colossus gives yes, me more uh... of the vibe of Monster Hunter rather than Assassin's Creed. Uh, in the sense that the combat is the focus of the game rather than like the exploration and like the adventure and whatnot. So it's more like a boss rush but made video game. The um, game uh, Assassin's Creed, that's that was based originally on something like Sands of... Perugia? I can't remember it. Prince Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia, yeah. Did anyone actually... Did anyone in this podcast play Prince of Persia? Yep, I played all of them. I watched the movie. I did. The PlayStation 2. I love the... I, I didn't play anything. When I stepped into Assassin's Creed, I was like, oh, this is new and awesome. And I was like, oh, it's based off Prince of Persia. I was like, what's, what's that game? Um. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, they're actually making a remake for the original Prince of Persia, and uh, things are not looking good for them. But I do say the the game is really, uh, really a classic. It is a bit similar to, uh, well, not very similar to Assassin's Creed, but let's say that's the imp uh, Assassin's Creed is the inspiration through uh, uh, thanks to uh, Prince of Persia. Uh, its story is very simple and unique, and what made it a really incredible game, I would say, it's gameplay mechanics, specifically the ability to like revert time. So let's say if you died, you can just reverse time and uh, let uh, save yourself from uh, dying, I would say. And there's the ability to slow down time, and uh, some of the bosses are very great. For me personally, I really liked the third game. The third was really my favorite. The bosses are really great. Its story was very simple and incredible in my opinion. So yeah, Prince of Persia was the inspiration for Assassin's Creed. But knowing Ubisoft, and this is what I, why I hate that company, they threw Prince of Persia away uh, and just supported Assassin's Creed. Because Prince of Persia had so much potential, yet they 
throw it away. I think you're right. I think the problem was that Prince of Persia had too much good stuff going on where like it was too complicated for them to recreate or make a sequel or anything like that. Where Assassin's Creed, I'm not trying to say it's a very simple gameplay, but it's very straightforward comparatively, you know? Well, you do need to consider that uh, the scale that the sales of Assassin's Creed made in comparison to King of Persia are just non-comparable. Like, King of uh, Prince of Persia was an amazing game, but, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, a good selling game. Not amazing, not splendid, it was good selling. But the Assassin's Creed uh, franchise, that's, uh, that's a milk cow that Ubisoft has taken every cent out of it. I think it's because uh, it was too ahead of its time and it was too complex for people of that time. Yeah, but can I, can I like, guys, ask you a question? I'm pretty sure most of you guys have played, like, uh, as it's, mm, Assassin's Creed games. I'm pretty, I'm positive you guys played some. Aren't you, like, a bit tired of uh, the usual every year or two year new Assassin's Creed game? Because I want Ubisoft to do something else. If they actually resurrect Prince of Persia, that would really ch uh, make a lot of people happy. Because I don't... Yeah, because I am really tired of every new year or two years a new Assassin's Creed is gonna come out. I mean, uh, Blue Fox, uh, this year, or I think next year, uh, well, specifically 2023, we've got a new Assassin's Creed game is gonna come out, and next year, another new Assassin's Creed is gonna come out. Like, why? One is enough. It's even worse, it's gonna be two new Assassin's Creed's. I mean, to be fair, it's a really long endeavor to part story game. It continues over and over each other. And when you've got something that really does that, um, like back in 2005, there was no law on Assassin's Creed. You, they, they were creating law. It was their first time making a background, you know, and doing all those checks and creating a story around it. Back then, you could get away with creating a game every year for a new franchise, and it would be good. These days, because everything that you mess, you know, every, everything that you create within that law of Assassin's Creed, every time you come out with a a new um, a game or something, or you come out with it with you know with new stuff, you, you you're coming out with a section of law that is altering every single part of that timeline. Now that we're like twenty years down the line of Assassin's Creed you really need to start going like, well, actually, maybe you should do some more research on your game and how that affects the whole storyline. Because, yeah, back then you could get away with it. Now you, you can't so much. You need to, yeah, and, you know, you need to make more interesting stories. You need to, there's nothing wrong with closing off and cancelling an entire franchise. There's nothing wrong with it. You can end a story, Ubisoft. You don't have to keep making part ones and part twos of the story. You can just make brand new games. That is a thing. <laughs> it's uh, although what you all say it's uh, noble in cost and it makes absolute sense and I do agree with it. I also take in consideration that games that are new IPs such as Skulls and Bones that Ubisoft is developing are looking pretty bad. And uh, people say, well, rather than to have a very bad new IP like Skulls and Bones, uh, I'd rather have an Assassin's Creed Black Flag 2 because you know I've seen the first one, it worked, I liked it, so I want the sequel. So it's, uh, you know, making, making news at peace is always a gamble because you want to make a game built out of scratch, but, you know, you don't know if the fundamentals of the game are strong or not. With the Assassin's Creed franchise, you know that, you know, if it's a good game or a bad game, you know that the fundamentals are there. People will buy the new Assassin's Creed regardless because it has, uh, it has its name. Yeah, like Call of Duty or like Battlefield or um, any other game that has uh, multiple entries in their, in their franchise. It's uh, companies don't feel uh, confident in making new IPs, which is sad because, of course, new IPs uh, are uh, high risk but also high reward. Uh, it's uh, we can think of uh, we can think a very good example on this topic. I would say Splatoon. That uh, it's a game that Nintendo developed. That it was planned to be a Mario related game, like you know Mario Kart, Mario Tennis, uh, Mario Golf, whatever. But they decided no, let's do a new IP. Let's make something new, and it worked. And now it had a f uh, third entry, and uh, yeah, it's a new series on its own. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, right. Um, I, I will mention just just on that one last bit of topic is I do like the fact that you can come out with a game as a test game, see what it perceives as an audience bef before you make it into the big franchise. But I think those games should definitely come out, but they should be like um, like twenty quid games or something that's small compact and it just like it gives like an audience like 
when you see a comedian go on tour and stuff like that, you always see them do this uh, like mini tour where they can um, practice their jokes before they give it out to a big audience. That's what, yeah, they test the waters. And I think that is something that's very important that uh, companies should do when they release their games. Going along with that, sorry, one last thing. But going along with what you said there, I feel like they could do that with the indie community because the indie community puts, puts out like thousands of games like every every day almost. And they could just reach out to the indie communities and see what people are liking and then they can take those ideas and make AAA games out of them. And yeah, I completely agree. Okay, Danny, next question. Uh, next question, I'm going to ask this to Blue Fox. Blue Fox, what games this year were you interested in playing? Games that were released uh, this year that I played this year? Yeah, that you were interested in playing this year. Like, you might might not have played it this year, but like, games you were interested in this well, year. Well, uh, a game that I was interested in and I actually played uh, was the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, which is a game that I've made a whole review about in my channel, but uh, too long didn't read. It's an amazing game and an amazing narrative experience that it's not too long. It's, I think, about something like five, six hours, and uh, it's splendidly written and it's uh, just a joy to play. I've played that game. It's super real and uh, absurd, and it's it's uh, the Ultra Deluxe version specifically. It's kind of a sequel to the original game. So the original game was fairly short, like three to four hours. Well, this one it's a bit longer. It has more endings, more content, more things to do, and it has everything that the original game had. So if you didn't play the original game, you can just buy the Ultra Deluxe, and you will have basically the first one plus the new content. And well, I haven't actually played the original game, but I do have the Ultra Deluxe, and I got to admit, the game like isn't like your typical game. Like it's quite slow paced, but it's re it's really like n unique because like the narrator is really funny. Because I find them hilarious, and like there's like ten different endings. There's like more than ten endings, and that I yeah, there's like more than twenty. Well, I don't know. All I know is there's a lot of endings. It's a good game. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, certainly Parable. I mean. I don't know if I consider it a new game. I consider like it like the the ultra deluxe content more DLC than anything. But uh it is very interesting because that game came out a long time ago and to see it come back out of like the woodwork out of nowhere is really strange to me, but I'm glad it did. I've seen other people play it and the ex the way they expand the universe and they were able to build upon what was already there. Stanley Parable was already very interesting on its own because it was like a choose your own adventure kind of third person narrative where there was an omniscient like kind of godlike figure narrating every choice you did. But the weird thing is when you said earlier that it was like a five, six hour game. When I think that I think five, six hour linear, like you like play God of War, you play the storyline, it's like five, six hours linear. But in actuality, the Stanley, Stanley Parable, it's like a 20 minute game, depending on which ending you choose. But its replayability is massive. Yeah, the game's like a continuous loop. Like every time like you do something, you go back to the start and you have to redo the whole thing. It's uh, it's very, uh, how do you say this? It is very unique indeed. Uh, I already have discussed about the game previously, so I don't want to spend too much time in it. But uh, it is uh, an amazing experience that was released this year in uh, the 27th of April. And uh, I suggest everyone here and here in the podcast to give it a shot. All right. Ne okay, I'm asked this to Gelix. Gelix, what games this year have you been interested in playing or that you've played and you really enjoyed this year? Well, I've had a very busy year this year, so I really haven't been able to play anything new that came out this year, but I have been able to watch other content creators play games that I wanted to play this year, like the new God of War that just came out, Ragnarok. Well, I don't have a PS4 or PlayStation, so I've never played God of War Ragnarok. Yeah, I've seen all of the God of War Ragnarok that came out um, this year. I saw the entire playthrough, and I gotta say, I'm both happy and sad about the way it ended. I'm not gonna spoil anything, but it is a nice journey from the original God of War to see how Kratos' character has changed over time, and to see how he has become from this wrathful, angry god to this knowledgeable, um, slow-paced kind of understanding person. Actually, if you, if you, uh, sorry to cut you off. Actually, if you like uh, try to understand why they did that with the ending, it actually has a beautiful meaning behind it. Of how Kratos, uh, the change of Kratos, yeah. I uh, yeah, I, I get why they did it. Yeah, I, I get why they did it, but it's like 
you get used to this character and the way he is, and it's like, it's kind of like, it's not, it's more I was sad because it was a, it was basically the end of his character in a way, but he didn't die, obviously, but like, it was kind of the end of an era of the Kratos that we've known and come to love. Yeah, that may be true. Who knows, man? I do see some potential that you might expand on his story a little bit. Because now he's a completely different person and a new guy. You want to see like this, how, what will this new Kratos do and what will he achieve? And that's something that really got me hooked. But who knows, man? I just don't know how they're going to tie it to future games because the fact is like the way that he is now seems like he has no other reason to go to other polytheistic countries and face on those gods because he's learned, you know? So I just don't know how they're going to be able to piece it to other games, you know, because they've mentioned the fact that there's other gods in the game when they talked about like Egyptian gods and all the other different polytheistic religions that have the possibility of future games, but I just don't understand how they would tie that in unless something dramatic happened to Kratos at the start of the next game or they continue on from his son. Yeah, I do say, I, I think there are like two potential stories that they might expand upon. Uh, I think this will, is going to happen. They're probably going to focus more on Atreus and uh, the story that uh, left him on. They're probably going to continue with another game. And uh, one thing that I I don't know if it's got, if it's possible that it happened, but if it happens, I'd really be excited for. It would be like a new God of War game where actually Kratos returns to the Greek mythology and try to, let's say, rebuild it. That would be really be great. Oh, and yeah, that would be great. And I could see the potential of other polytheistic gods trying to move in on the turf of Rome, and then Kratos has to fight them instead to keep the people that he had just previously freed from the uh, the wrathful gods. But I also have an idea, too, on the fact that from the uh, prophecy that you see from the other God of War game leading into Ragnarok of the demise of Kratos that you see on the epitaph on the wall... I still think that's a possibility for future games, and that's how it will lead into Atreides', Atreides story. He will go and f try to fight the people who did in his father, or something like that. Maybe. I guess the future is left for Santa Monica, but it's gonna take... Yeah, it's gonna take some uh, a really long while until we see Kratos again, or maybe Atreus. Yeah, only time will tell. Just a quick question for you, Gilix. Are, what what are you like? Let's say excited for more a story about a future story about Atreus or a continuation story about Kratos? Which one, let's say, would you pick? I feel like they haven't built up Atreus's character enough for him to have a solo game quite yet. I feel like the next, I mean, they almost did it with Ragnarok, being able to switch back and forth between Kratos as a main character and Atreus as a main character. But I feel like in the next game, something major has to happen to solidify Atreus' character in order to make the game about him instead. I I, I will add in um, that uh, that you can pretty much do anything with that type of franchise as long as you stay true to the mythology um, area of being able to really do whatever you want and to be and to see what they've done with it to see the fact that they've done that greek thing now i don't not a lot of people came in with the greek section but when it turned to north norse mythology um there it obviously you you see like um a complete uh well you, you see a bit of a difference whereas uh um you know, it's 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 all about those gods that you know well enough. You know, you know Thor and all that kind of thing. You can really take it anywhere from here. Like Camazoid said, you can bring everything back to um, obviously the main section, which is obviously you can bring it back to Greek if you really wanted to. Or my prediction is you could bring it to Egyptian. Yeah, there is a. They really kind of because there's a whole Egyptian mythology as well. You could, you could, you could go anywhere with anything. They really kind of honed in on that in some of the sections of the game of like hinting, oh, we're probably gonna do an Egypt game later. The best strategy for Santa Monica Studios to like keep the hype going on with God of War. I think their next move should uh, be uh, should be like a remake on the original God of War 1 and God of War 2 because those two games are just such an amazing classic and having them uh, and 
have and and like doing a remake on them would really 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 be a great move for Santa Monica Studios and especially PlayStation because not not well not a lot of people know about the original God of Wars and those games are phenomenal masterpieces I would say and I would really love to see them remake yeah yeah they really need to remake those with better graphics uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. Camazoid, specifically, what games are you interested in? Um... Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll take it away. Take it away. Games that I am interested in playing, but I wasn't able to. This year? Okay, well, there are three games that I really uh, want to try out. Two of them I am going to try out, but one I can't, which is Bayonetta, Bayonetta 3 from Nite Nintendo Switch. That game's. I'm really a huge fan of the Bayonetta series, and I played the first game and the second, of course. Loved both of them. I really love the main character, uh, Bayonetta. Uh, this game's uh, a, li a little bit similar to Devil May Cry with the hack and slash and all that moves, move set and gameplay style. And this one, they took it way too overboard with the kaiju fights and all and everything going around. Uh, it is a game that I really want to play and really try out, but I do need to get the Switch, and that is not a not a possibility. Uh, the other two games that uh, I I am very interested in playing and going to try out this year are uh, uh, Call yeah Callisto Protocol. It just came out this month. Uh, a, yeah, a game inspired by Dead Space and created by the same guy who made Dead Space, a horror game. Which, uh, well, to be completely fair, I was going to buy it, but I heard a lot of bad news about it being all a bit buggy and glitchy. So many people say, wait until they drop some updates and fix it up. But they do say that it's a really a good game. Not a solid one, but it's good. So I'm going to wait until the, the price drops and maybe then buy it. And one more game, it's probably Final Fantasy VII uh, Crisis Core Reunion. I'm a huge fan of the Final Fantasy VII games, and uh, this one is, uh, let's say, uh, the first story before the Final Fantasy VII story. So I've been really interested in checking it out and to know the what what are the events uh, before the uh, the events of the original game, which is Final Fantasy VII and all. And it is a game that prepared me for uh, the what's coming up next from Square Enix in terms of the Final Fantasy VII games. So yeah. Those are the games that I've really been interested in trying out this year. Very good. Very good. Um, should we go to the next question? Okay, before we move on to the next question, and there's a little cut and edit in here, so try to ignore that, but um, um, someone's just joined the podcast, so I will just let him introduce himself really quickly, but I am disappointed because he's shown up really late and we got a soundtrack just for you. This is how I feel about you right now. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. You shoot me? Wait, uh, Seb lives in Britain. There's no FBI. <laughs> Wait, Logan, are you from the Americas? Or Elwood, are you from the Americas? Uh, yeah. I'm not so alone anymore! <laughs> America boys represent. Go on then, introduce yourself and tell us about your channel. Hello, it's me, now only known as Elwood. Uh, sorry I had work last night, so I was a little bit tired. So, uh, we're talking about snow and video games? No, we're not. <laughs> oh. We're talking about games of future, present, and past. Danny is going to give you the next question. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Elwood, next question. I'm asking this to you. What games are you looking forward to play next year? Ugh, I, that's, a, that's a hard question. Um, I'm definitely... Ex <laughs> I'm definitely excited... I'm definitely excited to see what that Wolverine game has to uh, offer because, like, they released a trailer for it and they never showed anything, so I can't wait for that. And then I'm also excited for AEW Fight Forever. Well, I'm excited for Dead Island 2. So, next question, we're going to pass this on to... Blue Fox. No... Blue Fox, what games are you looking forward to playing next year or in the next 10 years? 
Well, I've been in this podcast uh, for a long time, so if uh, Kamisot can be known as the elder boy, I'm the Zelda boy, because uh, of course the game I'm looking forward for next year is uh, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, the official sequel. Yeah! yeah! <laughs> Heck yeah! I, I didn't envision this uh, excitement, but uh, yes, I am excited for this game and I will explain why. Uh, of course, Nintendo has a very good track record uh, with the Zelda franchise, so I don't see why this has to be the Zelda to ruin such a uh, track record. And uh, although it's been postponed uh, quite a lot, it's been postponed because it's been developed uh, quite uh, pedantically. Also, the original Breath of the Wild was uh, postponed uh, for three years uh, from what was announced. So I believe that these postpones are just to make the game better, and hopefully in May we'll find out uh, the quality of Tears of the Kingdom. Cool. Um, next, okay, I'm asked to Glix as well. Glix, what games are you looking forward to playing next year? I mean, if you couldn't tell from my excitement of the whole Zelda game, I am very excited. I've been a, a Nintendo fan ever since I was a young wee lad. Back in the day, I used to play on the Nintendo 64. My first exposure was Mario 64. I don't know why. I don't know why that happened. I'm sorry. Basically, when Jalex plays Nintendo games and it's specifically anything to do with Zelda, he turns Scottish. I get so excited that I turn I turn into another person from my past life who. Never got to play Legend of Zelda because he died horrifically <laughs> before he got the chance. Yeah, he, he got his head chopped off by a Viking. Wow, he didn't have to take it to the dark side, man. Oh, 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 oh sorry. Everyone shut up for a second. I just remembered another game that's coming out next year. Sons of the Forest. Ooh. Have you ever oh. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me, guys. Come on. <laughs> I bring the chaos, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sons of the Forest. The sequel to the most buggy game I've ever played, The Forest. <laughs> but the most fun game I've ever played. It was like the first game I ever downloaded when I got my gaming PC finally. And I, it's like one, I actually have uh, quite a few episodes of it on my channel, a few live streams of it on my channel. I just can't wait to see how buggy Sons of the Forest is going to be. I mean, did, did you complete the original game? And if so, what did you think about the particular ending? I've never actually beaten the game. I've played it and restarted it 500 different times because I just get to the point where I don't play the game for a long time. And I'm like, oh, whatever, I'll just start over. And I've never got the actual ending. I heard that there's at least three endings to the game. There's a couple of endings, yes. Okay, has anyone played the game... Um, Green Hell. No. No? I'm surprised no one's actually played the game Green Hell. Um, because it, it for me, it's like a, like a, like, so, like it, it feels like the forest, but harder. And, no, it's not in Hell. It's, 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 you're stuck in the jungle. It's, 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 um, the, see, the forest is trapped in the forest, and Green Hell is pretty much the same thing, but it's not, thingy. it's, it's, it, yeah, it's in the jungle. So, uh, but um, they're both really tough, but I think that uh, Green Hell's a little bit more tougher because you get diseases and if you don't fix them up, you, you're pretty much dead while dealing with all the other stuff. I don't play the forest because it's hard. I play the forest because it's crazy. That's very true. Buggy. The forest is crazy buggy. No, it's true. Right, should we get on to the next question? All right, this is a really long one, so it is open. I'm going to ask this to Camazoid. Camazoid. What do you think the future of gaming will be like? Because recently the Xbox Series S had came out with no disk drive. So do you think the future of gaming will be all digital or all disk? And will we have to only download our games off the cloud? Hmm. It depends. Yeah. It depends on how far are you looking. Let's say if you're looking like 10 years ahead, I'll say that the disk is going to continue to be available. Because it is a very important uh, aspect when it comes to like uh, gaming, uh, but I do. Let's say, yeah, if you're but if you're looking like let's say 30 years ahead or 20 years ahead, I do think that it's going to change to digital. But so far, and I hope 
I hope it remains uh, the rem the disc remains available because you do you always know that there's like those good old classic gamers that only la that only appreciate or like to buy to buy the discs. You can't do a midnight release like you did ages ago with a game that's only digital. You can't wait outside in the cold with all your fellow gamers queuing up in the you know in in, in the freezing you're going guy. I want to get the special edition of Halo because it's got an awesome mask. It's we all you all you all spoke how discs are inevitable, but how many of you bought a game for computer with a disc? I did once, but like it would never work because I had a built-in PC, but it was awful. A lot of the people who play uh, PC gaming, uh, they have Steam, Epic Game Stores, and whatnot, and I think uh, it's. Uh, yeah, the last PC game that I bought with a disc was Spore Creator. Right, so so I was saying, so out of the people who have Steam and have Epic Stores in their PC, they never buy a game on um, disc. They just don't do it. So my question to you is then, like, you know, you think it's inevitable because uh, it's, uh, you know, we have seen uh, the Xbox Series S and the PlayStation 5 Lite that don't have the disc drive, but that could be the standard in uh, not even that long. I think even five years I would give it. It's uh, printing discs. Uh. You think like uh, by the next consoles, let's say PS6 and Xbox XS Super Size, whatever they're gonna call it. It's uh, whatever the name is. I believe. I believe so. Uh, do don't do not forget that the disc drive itself it's about uh, 50 euros. So you can shave off that 50 euros uh, from your consoles right from the get go. And then uh, printing the discs is also expensive. So since we see game, since we see the um, since the new AAA games being 80 bucks uh, and people are starting to complain because like oh it's too expensive uh, then uh, the companies might say well it's 80 bucks if you buy it on disc but if you buy it digitally then you know we don't have to print the disc and whatnot so it's you know 10 years less and that's uh, you know and, and that's already something something that makes you think so uh, it's it is sad I, I do understand but yeah yeah Looking at it, uh, yeah. Looking at it from uh, looking at it from a company's perspective, you do make a lot of sense, and I do agree with you. But then again, the uh, I mean, Microsoft and uh, Sony Playstations are two big companies, so I don't think that you might uh, 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 let's say try that solution. Things do get expensive, let's say each and every single year, as things get more and more powerful. But uh, they're basically, let's say, killing an, uh, an audience if they actually do that. Because there will always be people who are more, w more willing to buy discs rather than buy it uh, digitally. And also, don't, for don't forget about the, risk, uh, the risks we have uh, when, let's say, uh, buying something digitally. Because you can always lo somehow lose your account or get hacked and then lose all your games and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, that can still happen. So I do, I do agree with you, Blue Fox, but I do see this in like the next 15 years, not in the next five years. I mean, to go on with that, I think the next fact would be that maybe it doesn't move from discs immediately to online digital downloads, but kind of does what Nintendo did with the Switch and moved to cartridges. Something much smaller, something that doesn't scratch, something you can take everywhere with you. And also, the strange thing, well, not really strange, but the interesting thing about Nintendo is it actually incentivizes you to buy the cartridge rather than the digital download, because every cartridge you buy with the Nintendo Switch gives you these little gold coins you can download from it that help go towards your next purchase. All right, should we go on to the next question? All right. All right, next question is, I'm going to ask this to Gilex. Um, all right. Uh, the series SAO, Sword Art Online, has you has your mind uploaded to a game which means when you're playing the game you can like move your hands and like move your feet like you, like you're in the game but moving so you're like a massive room and actually moving so it's like VR but like using actually walking and running do you think this is ever going to be possible in the future uh, just to uh, sorry to cut you both off but just to be where uh, uh, make it more clear Danny for Sword Art Online, when they actually wear that VR headset, they kind of like, let's say, uh, go unconscious and all their like mind, yeah, they upload their conscience to the game, so it kind of feels like real life. That's how it works. 
if we had the technology, then absolutely, I think people would be willing to, like, upload their consciousness and play games and go into these virtual worlds, but obviously we're not there yet, but if we're going to talk about what we do have now is VR is always being advanced, always getting new things to make it more one-to-one -one with what you're doing in the game is what you're doing in real life and vice versa. For instance, they do now have treadmill track pads where you wear these shoes and you're able to walk on the treadmill track pad and it will have you walk in the game. So it's more immersive and it more feels like you're actually doing the things in the game because the biggest problem that they've had with VR for the longest time is motion sickness. One, for the refresh rate on the console or the headset that you're wearing isn't always the same as you moving your head, which causes a lot of motion sickness and not all games are optimized for that. But if you had the ability to actually move your head in real time and be able to walk in real time, your body would be able to calibrate and get used to those motions and make it feel more like you're actually in it so you'd lead to less motion sickness. And that is the biggest deterrent for a lot of VR games, minus the price obviously, is the fact that there's a lot of motion sickness involved. Oh no, okay, um, I was I was just gonna say, in the third season of Sword Art Online, because I absolutely love the series, um, I, I, I there was this bit in Hospital where, oh, was it season two or season three? I can't remember, but it was like, there was this bit in Hospital uh, where you see this uh, girl and uh, she's in hospital and the only way that she can actually move her body is inside the game. So she couldn't really move on the outside, but she can move on the inside of the game. Hospital-wise and treatment-wise, it can, it can give people a way to still be able to live their lives, even if they're, like, um, suffering. You could get that, like, um, vision of, like, if, you know, like, it... it VR could help if you know with consciousness uploads it could help with uh, making people feel better that uh, probably don't I don't know that that maybe have medical issues in the future yeah that happened in Spy Kids 3 yeah kind of like that kind of like the Oasis from Ready Player One but maybe a bit more different but uh, Blue Fox you said you wanted to add something uh, yes and I would say that uh, I'm more skeptical than uh, you gentlemen because uh... I don't really have a very positive opinion on like all the metaverse things and VR and whatnot. In the sense that like yes, I believe they are powerful tools and that they will be more uh, present in the market. They're gonna be less expensive, uh, uh, for instance. So people will definitely have a uh, uh, more experience with it, so they will feel a bit more comfortable playing with it. However, I don't really see the direction of video games going into that direction specifically. It's like uh, remember like the Nintendo Wii when like the Wii introduced like motion control and the Xbox introduced the Kinect and PlayStation, the PlayStation Move and everyone was like, oh yeah, now you're gonna move your body to play and whatnot like, yeah, nobody really was on board with that, everyone, like the thing with gaming is that gaming is leisure, it's, you know, just to have fun and pass time so, it's, uh, although it sounds fantastic, the idea of, you know, uploading yourself uh, and then like going into a digital world and adventure it would be really tiresome, like, you know, when you play video games, you just want to sit on the couch, play a little bit, then, I don't know, go to the bathroom or, you know, go for a drink and then come back, like, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be that guy that's always pessimistic with new technologies, I might be proven wrong in 20 years, but uh, currently at the very least, uh, I don't think there is a, there is a technology, but not the uh, culture for it. I agree with you on the VR side of that. That is definitely something that deters people is they don't always want to be active when they're playing. However, if you do get to the technology space of like Sword Art Online or be able to virtually upload your consciousness, physical tiredness would not be the same, you know, because if you upload your consciousness into these like Say if you upload your consciousness and now you're Mario. Mario is a fat Italian plumber, but that can freaking do backflips and he never gets tired. Do you think if- He's built different. Ex <laughs> He's built different. Like, if you upload your consciousness, depending on what game you're playing, it could change how you physically feel. I don't know how they would do that, but you know, that is that is a theory. It is uh, it is a theory, and again, I cannot prove or- I cannot prove or disprove it, but what I'm saying is that you know, when once you're playing, it's because you're coming off of a long day of studying or work or uh, whatever, and you just want to have like, you know, just want to chill, just want to relax. You don't want to put too much emphasis on what you're doing. So literally, being transported in a gaming world where you have to save the world and kill thousands of enemies. I mean, that is 
you know, it, it depends on the game, of course, but e even... Because uh, if you have the ability to virtually upload yourself, you could do so much. You could virtually up yourself to be on a beach and go swimming. And, you know, that kind of goes against what you're saying at the fact that it's stressful because not every game is meant to be stressful or high energy or high action. Like, a lot of simulator games are just kind of like chill games. Imagine if you could just simulate the beach and just go there and chill out and read a book and that's the game. And if you're able to upload your consciousness, I would imagine it's much like a dream state where even though you everything feels real, you're not actually feeling it like the tiredness or everything. You're just feeling like those neuro signals to your brain that make you feel like you're eating or make you feel like you're breathing or something like that. It's uh, I, I would say I would say that this would be I would be that that would be like in a very very long time. Uh, I don't see this in the near but future. But to your fact, yeah, that is a long time, and I can see the negative impacts too. Imagine a game where people get killed like call of duty would they feel that would they feel the pain would that deter them from playing and stuff like that yeah good point it's it's kind of a scary it can be a scary future of what the technology could bring if you die in the game do you die in real life did you uh, to continue on this topic uh, glx wait 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 a minute guys i want to i want to know if you did did you hear about the like this uh, uh news that dropped from IGN, someone actually created a VR set that if you die in the game, you die in real life. I swear, I swear, somebody actually made it. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. No. <laughs> Can I just add on to that? Can I just add on to that? So, also, what the guy's trying to do is, when, like, he obviously wants to make it, so if you die in the game, you die in real life. But what else, he, what else he is trying to do is, when you put the VR headset on, it locks and you can't take it off. So when you put it on, you, you either win the game or you either die. Uh... That actually so smart, man. Nice, nice thinking. It's sorted out online. We should give that to like people on death row, so like they have a chance of like earning their freedom. No, dude, we should get... No, 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 no. Here's here's a real challenge. We should get the death row inmates, give them this headset, and put in Dark Souls. If you win, you have the right to live, my man. You have the right of freedom, and nobody will mess with you if you w beat it without dying. Now that now that's a way for these inmates to actually survive. Now that is a real challenge. I'm I'm just I'm just thinking of the guys who played this. So let's say let's say it's an inmate who beats uh, Dark Souls so many times. He like give him this chance. If he's like I'm ready for this. I was born for this moment. And then he dies, the next five seconds he dies. And all right, next one. Imagine if they put that into phasmophobia. Gilex, do you think cloud gaming will be the way of the future? So everything exists in this cloud space so that you can download it whenever. I think that, I don't think the technology is there yet. I think Google is actually working on something secretive of something like that. Do you know what Stadia is and how it just basically just uh, got canceled or failed? It failed, but didn't fail. They're basically reusing, from what I heard this, they're taking the different server sites for Stadia. And I think what they're gonna do is kind of do like this cloud-based gaming where you can play your game from any device that has a, a Wi-Fi connection, so it doesn't matter, and it's going to be almost zero lag and stuff like that. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, that, 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 that was Stadia. I know that is what it's Stadia is, but Stadia failed. They're going to revamp it, I believe, is what their next plan is. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's it's only it's only it's only Stadia. It's also GeForce Now Stay and Dudo. PlayStation Now, and also uh, Xbox uh, Cloud. It's um, it's there are more services uh, of uh, cloud gaming, which uh, I think they work. Um, for instance, like if you have, uh, if you are a PC gamer, uh, you can literally install GeForce Now for free, and you can play some of your games uh, online, which is very handy because uh, you know you can play games like you know Cyberpunk uh, with like the highest settings in like a potato computer because the computer doesn't need to like run anything within the computer, but it uh, runs uh, stream, so that's very handy. But at the same time, uh, the lag, uh, whew, it's still 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 pretty bad. Until the aliens give us the superconductors we need, lag will always be a problem. It could be the future in a sense that like it's gonna be more common. That's that's probably true. And if it is, it's uh, convenient because then nobody needs to buy a new console. Because uh, I mean, why do you need the PlayStation 6 when the PlayStation 5 has internet and can connect to the uh, cloud gaming? What's uh, what does the PlayStation 6 does that the other one doesn't? 
Same goes with computer. Why do you need to buy a 490 Ti graphics card when you can just uh, when you can just like you know stream it out? I mean, my phone can stream games, so so can uh, any computer. But uh, but then again, then then are uh, companies incentivized to do that because you know. Uh, PlayStation doesn't want to sell less PlayStations, so what, where's the rush, right? Probably a subscription-based service to make up for their losses. Yeah, but uh, people may say like, oh, but I don't want a subscription. I only play, uh, you know, three games a year, so why do I need to pay like a hundred euros, uh, uh, you know, for a subscription of like... Uh... Because we want money. Yeah, but like, the PlayStation doesn't make the games. That's the thing, so... Yeah, it's a, it's a give and take. They might end up with some losses from people who are not wanting to do that, but they might end up with some gains from people who really want to do that. It's just the market research. It's a, it, it is um, it is up in the air. Uh, we need to wait more, I think. Or maybe they just have a separate thing for the first couple of years of implementing it where you can still get the console, or you could do their subscription-based service and just they see what the numbers are. Right, that is it of the Jump Inside podcast. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll post links to all... These guys' channels, Blue Fox, uh, Camazoid, Elwood Productions, GLix, and etc. And subscribe to them as well because they post amazing videos. And also comment in the comments below what do you think the future of gaming would be like. And we will see you next year for the next podcast. Merry bye Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Happy Christmas. Year, everyone. We love you. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas.